This evening we are looking at Galatians chapter 3 verses 15 to 17. Our subject is a God-made covenant. And we will read from the English Standard Version. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say unto offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. Father, here we are in your presence. We have intentionally taken the time out to spend with you in the company of our brothers and sisters to study your word to open our minds and our hearts with the understanding that the entrance of your word brings with it light, light that illuminates us within and without. And Lord, we ask for your help as we deliver your word and as we listen to your word, that your word would have the effect of transforming us on the inside and on the outside. For this we need your divine help, and of that divine help we can be well assured. And so we say thanks to you in the name of your Son, our Lord. Last week, we stated that in verses 15 to 18, Paul argues that the blessing of Abraham, and specifically the blessing of justification by faith, which includes the receipt of the Holy Spirit, this Blessing was covenanted to Abraham before the law was given. Before the law was given. Therefore, the law which came after cannot annul that which was done by God prior to its introduction. In these verses, the word promise is used three times, and the word promises is used one time. The words refer to God's promise to Abraham that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And we find that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. In this section, in verses 15 to 18, of Galatians chapter 3, Paul, as we said last week, addresses a probable argument of the Judaizers that since the law came after the Abrahamic covenant, it took precedence over that covenant. Some of the Judaizers may even have gone to the extreme of claiming that the Mosaic covenant of law annulled the Abrahamic covenant and therefore replaced it. They would have reasoned that God would not have 
given another covenant if the Abrahamic covenant was still to be considered valid. At the very least, at the very least, they were of the opinion that the law had been added to the Abrahamic covenant. Paul deals with the arguments of these legalists by showing that the law, which came later than the Abrahamic covenant, could not alter it. In verse 15, Paul writes, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. We know this. In this verse, Paul contends that the covenant that God made with Abraham is still in force. And he bases his argument upon the fact that it is a preeminent and unalterable covenant. He uses human logic. He says to give a human example. He makes an illustration from everyday life in order to argue his point. He states that it is common knowledge that when individuals make a contract that they all agree to, the contract cannot be modified or changed except by the mutual consent of all the parties. One party can't just go in and change the terms and conditions of the contract. Paul applies this rule to God's covenant with Abraham, contending that the Mosaic covenant of law cannot modify the Abrahamic covenant since it was given centuries later. The word covenant is a translation of the Greek word diatheke, which in its verb form means to place between two, to place between two. So a covenant is something placed between two. It is an arrangement between two parties. It refers to the act of two individuals placing between them something to which they obligate themselves. A covenant is a solemn binding arrangement between two parties and entails a variety of responsibilities, benefits, and penalties depending on the specific covenant which is being entered into. This just came into my mind, you know. I didn't plan to say this. But you know, a precious lady told me a couple weeks ago she operates a business and she says, Pastor, you know, I have instructed the members of my staff that if anybody comes to do business with us, for instance, if they want a loan and they say that they are a Christian, they are not to do business with them. And she said, Pastor, I know it sounds bad, but they never honor their responsibilities. She says, if we lend money to a Christian, it is because they do not declare that they are a Christian. And she says, once a person comes and says, I'm a Christian, you know, that is a guarantee that they will not pay the loan. Verse 
I'm not talking about word of mouth, you know, which that should be binding on a Christian. It should be, shouldn't it? But if we go so far as to sign a contract, then we should try our best to honor it, shouldn't we? And if we can't, if we find it difficult, shouldn't the onus be on us to go and say something? In the context of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15, the covenant refers to the agreement in which God entered into covenant relations with Abraham and in which he promised to justify him on the basis of his faith in the atonement which he himself God himself would someday offer. The Abrahamic covenant was not a covenant of works, but a covenant of grace. God's covenant with Abraham was unilateral and unconditional, and its integrity depended entirely on God. And we'll Look at that in a little more detail later. It was not a man-made covenant, but a God-made covenant. Now, whenever a lawyer constructs a case for the defense, he or she prepares arguments and counter-arguments. He or she needs to be able to argue the case from different vantage points to anticipate questions and formulate answers even before those questions are asked. And that is exactly what Paul has been doing throughout this letter. He has been preparing a thorough defense of the authentic gospel a thorough defense of his apostolic ministry. Paul's ultimate aim is to counter the erroneous legalistic teaching of the Judaizers, which was undermining the central New Testament doctrine of justification by faith and threatening to overthrow the faith of his precious Galatian converts. I remember Paul in 2 Corinthians 11, was it? When giving account of the struggles that he has gone through and is going through and he said the care of the churches the care of the churches that was one besides that he says this comes upon me daily the care of the churches for me it is only the care of a church and it is so pressing on me i struggle to imagine what paul must have been dealing with the care of the churches. He said, who, who suffers and I don't burn? Paul's arguments are rooted in the Old Testament scriptures because the Judaizers had twisted the Old Testament scriptures in an attempt to support to support their false legalistic message and methods. They used the same Old Testament scriptures and twisted them to support their false doctrine. They didn't go to the Quran or any other holy book. They used the same Old Testament scriptures that Paul was using. 
as a result of the false legalistic teaching of the Judaizers, the Gentiles in the Galatian church had begun to doubt their identity as Abraham's children. They had begun to doubt their inheritance of the divine promises made to Abraham because they were not his physical descendants. They were now desirous of being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses in order to guarantee their status as members of God's family. Paul's argument goes in two directions. The first direction of his argument is, as we have seen, from an example of everyday life. Paul asks them to consider human covenants or contracts. Can they be dissolved or annulled? Of course not. At least not by any one of the parties. When two parties mutually agree and the covenant is confirmed by shaking hands or signing a piece of paper, it cannot be reversed without compromising the integrity of one of the parties. As it relates to the covenant that God made with Abraham, God cannot compromise his character. Let every man, let every man be a liar, but God has to be true. What he has promised he will do his contract with Abraham is irreversible. Moreover, what he promised to Abraham will come through his offspring or seed singular. Galatians 3.16 clarifies that the seed to which God refers to in Genesis is not in fact the descendants of Abraham, who are many, but Christ, who is one. Christ becomes the true heir of all the divine promises made to Abraham. So if we are to inherit any of the promises, we have to be in Christ. The second direction of Paul's argument is from the timeline. The promises were made to Abraham more than four centuries before the law was ever given to Moses. Could the law really supersede the promises if the promises were given first? Of course not. In verse 16, Paul writes, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say unto offsprings. Referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. In this verse, Paul argues that the covenant of promise, the Abrahamic covenant, was superior to the covenant of law because it was Christ-centered. It was that should be centered, not catered. It, I'm sorry, it should be centered. It was centered in Jesus Christ, the offspring, our seed. It was centered in Jesus Christ, the offspring, our seed. Different from the covenant of law. Commenting on this verse, Kenneth Weiss says, and I quote, the promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, Christ. But when Christ is seen as seed of Abraham here, all those saved by him are included. The word seed when used in the singular number in the Old Testament, means progeny. 
descendants, offspring, thus to Abraham personally and to all those who by faith in Christ are brought into salvation were the promises made. So the promises were not made merely to Abraham. The promises were really centered in Christ and to all those who are in Christ. The fact that the promises were made to Abraham and to all believers all down the ages who follow Abraham in his act of faith indicates that the faith way of salvation existed before the law was given. Continued through the time the law was in force and still is in effect after the abrogation of the law at the cross. Thus, the entrance of the law did not affect the covenant at all. That's why I have been trying to drive it home to us, brethren, that God has always had one way of saving people. There is not a gospel for the Jews and a different one to the Gentiles and some people believe that the everlasting gospel that we read of in Revelation is a different gospel. It cannot be. How could it be? How could we ever have, have imagined that God had different ways of saving people? So what we argue is that in this dispensation, God saved persons this way. So in the dispensation of conscience, he saved Noah by way of the ark. He saved Noah by grace, through faith in Christ. That's how every single person is saved. Don't let nobody tell you that after the rapture, during the tribulation, people are going to be saved without accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. They will be saved by some other means than gospel. Rubbish. Nobody can be saved in any other way but by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, the Abrahamic covenant could only be fulfilled by Christ. Only in the infinite Son of God could all the families of the earth be blessed. But Christ is viewed in this chapter as also being the head of a new family. A new family. According to Galatians 3, 28 to 29, all who receive him by faith become sons of Abraham in a spiritual sense. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. If Paul was living now, he would say there is neither black or white. There is no male and female. God doesn't even recognize gender distinctions as it relates to his placing people into the body of Christ. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. 
Paul writes, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. When God made a covenant with Abraham, he promised him an offspring or a seed singular. In Genesis 22, 15 to 18, we read the following. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I want you to notice something with the Abrahamic covenant. There is no if. You notice that? The Mosaic law is full of ifs. I will do this if you do this. In the Abrahamic covenant, God just says, I will do this. You know why that is so? Because in the Mosaic Covenant, God's fulfilling of his end of the, bar of the bargain depended on their fulfilling their part. But God knew they couldn't fulfill their part. So in the Abrahamic Covenant and in the New Covenant, there are no ifs. God says, I will do this. That is why he walked through the parts by himself. He says, if you fail to do your part, I will bear the penalty for it. In the Mosaic Covenant, under the Mosaic Covenant, if they fail to do their part, they bore the penalty of it. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Now look at verse 18. In that verse, we are informed that it is through that offspring or seed, singular, that all the nations of the world would be blessed. So the promise that God made to Abraham was actually the promise of salvation, which would be made available to both Jews and Gentiles. And just as Abraham entered that covenant by faith, so to all who are descendants of Abraham, likewise enter that covenant by faith. The Abrahamic covenant was an unconditional covenant covenant that God planned and implemented. Man's part was to receive and enter the covenant by faith. Today, although the new covenant supersedes the Abrahamic covenant, they are related in the sense that both were made or cut by God. Both are unconditional, and both are entered into by faith. Lord Jesus, help us. Brethren, when I think about this, you know, I am appalled at some of the practices that we have developed to ensure that we know that people are saved. Where it is dependent on human beings. It is set up to be dependent on human beings. 
In the Hebrew, the word translated offspring or seed in Genesis 22, 18 is zera. The word is singular, describing one descendant, not plural, describing many descendants. And Paul tells us in Galatians 3.16, that the one descendant is Christ. Warren Wearsby explains that the Bible concept of the seed goes back to Genesis 3.15, after the fall of Adam and of every human being in Adam. God addresses Satan in the form of the serpent directly and says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. That is something, you know, brothers and sisters. If we were to take the time to deal with this this evening, we couldn't deal with it in one evening. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In this verse, God states that there will be conflict in the world between Satan's seed, the children of the devil, and the woman's seed, the children of God, and ultimately God's son, Jesus Christ. The scriptures reveal this conflict. Cain versus Abel. Moses versus Pharaoh. Let me just say this, brethren. I know that some of us are watching the Moses documentary on Netflix. Or are watching it. Or have watched it. I beg of you, don't swallow everything you see there, hook, line, and sinker. Stay in the word, please. Please. Be biblical. I didn't say you not to watch it, you know. But don't worry, go away and say, you know that Moses... This did happen to Moses. You don't know if it happened to him. The Bible didn't say it happened to him. Stick to the book. You can be sure of what the book says. Conflict between Moses versus Pharaoh. Israel versus the pagan nations. David versus Goliath. You remember what David says? David didn't say, you have defied Israel, you know. You have defied the Lord God. David says, I come to you in the name of the God of Israel whom you have defied. This is a matter between your God and my God. Satan seed and the seed of the woman. Conflict, Jesus versus the Pharisees, John the Baptist and the Pharisees. The true believer, wheat, versus the counterfeit believer, tears. you find that in Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Satan's goal in the Old Testament was to keep the seed, Christ, from being born into the world. For he knew that the seed would one day crush his head. What do you think the whole deal was with Pharaoh making sure to kill all the male babies? What do you think that was about? <laughs> 
that was Satan's attempt to ensure that the seed wouldn't come on the scene. What do you think Herod killing all the babies two years old and under in Bethlehem was about? His attempt to destroy the seed. It's a serious thing, you know, brethren. I want to read something to you from John chapter 8. You have your Bibles with you? Look at John chapter 8, verse 39. Let's look at verse 38. Jesus says, I speak of what I have seen with my Father. I wonder when Jesus saw something with the Father. Anyway, that's not our bird this evening. And you do what you have heard from your father. So we're talking about two different fathers right there. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Incidentally, Jesus is implying here that one day he told Abraham the truth and Abraham did not seek to kill him. I hope you see that in the text. Listen again. He says, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has Hold you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Abraham heard the truth of a man from God. I wonder when that was. And when Abraham heard the truth from Jesus, he did not seek to kill Jesus. I'm sorry, folks, to inform you that Jesus was around before Bethlehem. I'm sorry. There is a person of the Son. I'm sorry. You're going to have to deal with it. This is not a fairy story. I think Jesus is dreaming. He says, you are seeking to kill me, a man that God has sent. And yet you are saying you are the children of Abraham, but Abraham did not do this. Jesus is not making up something. That's not our burden, but it is our burden, but it is not our burden. It is slightly our burden, but not fully, not yet. Listen to this. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. That we're talking about Jesus there, you know. They were saying, we're not sure how you come about, you know, because nobody knows who your father is. So you're talking to us like you're so pure. We weren't born out of sexual immorality. We don't know where you come from. Mix up story. Who is your father? But Jesus didn't even deal with that. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. That is the seed that you are. Hmm. 
In the final analysis, God made this covenant of promise with Abraham through Christ so that the only two parties who can make any changes are God the Father and Christ. Moses cannot alter this covenant. He can add nothing to it and he can take nothing from it. John MacArthur has a wonderful explanation which I will read to us. The one and only heir of every promise of God is Christ. Every promise given in the covenant with Abraham was fulfilled in Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. Therefore, the only way a person can participate in the promised blessings to Abraham is to be a fellow heir with Christ through faith in him. Whether before or after Christ came to earth, salvation has always been provided only through the perfect offering of Christ on the cross. Let me read that again. Whether before or after Christ came to earth, salvation has always been provided only through the perfect offering of Christ on the cross. Believers who lived before the cross and never knew any specifics about Jesus were nevertheless forgiven and made right with God by faith in anticipation of Christ's sacrifice. Whereas believers who live after the cross are saved in looking back to it. We have heard this repeatedly, not ad nauseum because we have to always say it, but repeatedly. The, when Christ shed his blood, it covered sins on both sides of the cross. Before the cross and after the cross. The old covenant goes to the cross. The new covenant comes from it. On the one hand, faith pointed forward, whereas on the other, it points back. What is he saying? On the one hand, faith pointed forward to the Old Testament saints and said, look at what is coming. And on the other hand, faith points back to the New Testament sins and says, look at what has happened. There has never been, nor can there ever be, salvation apart from the finished work of Christ. Brethren, this should be so self-evident. How can a person be saved except through Christ? How, can, how else can sins be atoned for? What other arrangement could God make to save people except through the blood of Christ? The covenant with Abraham was fulfilled in the covenant of Jesus Christ. And therefore, the covenant of law whatever its character and purpose, did not abrogate or modify those two covenants, which really merge into one. If possible, this quotation from John MacArthur that you have in your notes, you should even commit it to memory. We should do that. so that we can stop the mouths of those who argue that God has several different ways to save people. Brethren, if you understand doctrine, if you understand God, you can see that that would be impossible for God to have more than one way to save people. Incidentally, 
Paul's theological argument concerning the Abrahamic covenant makes a strong affirmation of the verbal inspiration of Scripture. For he grounds his argument not merely on one word, but on one letter. The letter S in English, it is not seed, but seed. A whole doctrine based on just one letter. Thus the promised seed was not the nation of Israel, but the one person who alone could fulfill the great promises made to Abraham, namely Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The promises to Abraham do not reside in the Jewish people. I've been telling us that. They reside in Christ, and in Christ and through Christ, they are the inheritance of every individual believer, Jew or Gentile. The whole spiritual seed of Abraham concentrates in Christ. The promises to Christ and all those who are in Christ. On this point, Spurgeon says, notice how important a single letter of the scriptures may be. A vital doctrine may depend upon the use of a singular or plural noun. <laughs> In verse 17, Paul writes, this is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. The statement of the length of time that elapsed between God's covenant with Abraham and his giving of the law to Moses a period of 430 years implies that the law was something new and different and therefore could not affect the promise made to Abraham. The longer the Abrahamic covenant was in force as the exclusive method by which God justified sinners, the more powerful is Paul's argument. Paul probably took the figure of 430 years from Exodus 12, 40 to 41. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. The point, brethren, is that God was saving men and women on the basis of faith without works since the time of Adam or approximately 2,500 years before the law was given. The law was enforced from Moses to Christ or for a period of approximately 1,500 years. At the cross, it was done away with. The Judaizers not only attempted to retain the Mosaic institutions for the Jews, but try to impose them upon the Gentiles to whom the law was never given. This was what Paul was fighting against. So before the law was given, God was saving people by faith for 2,500 years. Paul's argument is as follows. If a covenant once in force cannot be changed or rendered valid by any subsequent action. God's covenant with Abraham cannot be changed or rendered void by the subsequent introduction of the law. We know that a person is justified by faith alone because God made his covenant of faith with Abraham before he gave the law to Moses and the children of Israel. 
the covenant of law did not appear on the scene until 430 years later. It is very important for us to know that when the law was given, God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 22, 18, that in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, had not yet been fulfilled. I want you to think about that. It had not yet been fulfilled because the seed referred to in this verse is a reference to Christ the Messiah who had not yet come. But the law couldn't change the Abrahamic covenant which had not yet been fulfilled. Therefore, the law could not annul or alter the Abrahamic covenant. As James Montgomery Boyce asks, if God had been blessing Abraham and his posterity through the way of promise for 430 years, and if he was, do, if he was to do the same for all men through Christ and his posterity, how could the giving of the law annul this promise? The Abrahamic covenant informed Abraham how he himself and all the nations would be blessed in or through his seed Christ. In Galatians 3, 6-9, which we have studied already, we read the following. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. In verse 14, we read, so that in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Therefore, when the law was given, it must have been given for a different purpose and Entirely than the justification of sinners. It could not have been given to inform lost, unregenerate, sinful human beings as to how they were to be justified or declared righteous or saved. For that truth had already been established in the covenant of faith given to Abraham. God had already told Abraham how sinners were to be justified or declared righteous or saved. He had said to them, by faith, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So the law couldn't come to tell us the same thing or a different thing. What is Paul saying? All of you who are pursuing works, you think you're going back to the original? You're going to something that was added that never even changed the covenant. The point is clear. No human being is justified by the law. That was not the purpose of the law. A person is justified by faith in the seed. Jesus Christ alone. Phil Newton explains that the uniqueness of the Abrahamic covenant as opposed to the covenant of the law is found in the details of its arrangement. And we'll close with this. He notes that the covenant of law ratified at Mount Sinai, in that covenant, God obligated himself to bless the children of Israel based on their total obedience to his law. 
he also obligated himself in the same covenant to curse the children of Israel based on their disobedience to his law. This Newton says was a covenant of mutual obligations. I will if you will. If you will not, I will not. And they never did. Why is it that they never did? Simple reason. Why is it that they never did? Sin. That's true, but I wanted you to say it another way. Why is it they never did? Because they never could. They never did because they never could. And guess what, brethren? Neither could we. Neither can we. Christ fulfilled the law for us. We couldn't fulfill it. Let me say this to us, brethren. The very, I was going to say the very day after we were saved, we would have broken the covenant of law. But before we left the church, the moment we were saved, we would have broken the covenant. You know it, you know, brethren. The Israelites were obligated to obey the law in its entirety, including all of its ceremonial and civil aspects. And God was obligated to bless or curse Israel, depending on how well they upheld their part of the bargain. Obviously, Israel failed to uphold their part. The covenant with Abraham, on the other hand, was one-sided. The Lord obligated himself to bless Abraham and all who come to faith in his seed, Jesus Christ, unconditionally. There is no mention of a curse. So if there's no mention of a curse for failing to keep your end of the bargain, how you believe that a saved person can be lost? It doesn't even make sense logically, you know. The covenant of law was based upon works. All of its promises were conditional, every single one. Every promise God made to Israel under the law had an if. But God's promises in the Abrahamic covenant were based upon pure grace. There were no conditions attached to them. The fulfillment of the promises did not depend upon anything Abraham did or did not do, nor upon anything his offspring did or did not do. Abraham made no promise to God either for himself or for his offspring after him. All the promises were made by God and carried with them no conditions whatsoever. It was not a man-made covenant, but a God-made covenant. Let me show you something, brethren. Let me just show you something quickly. Let's go back to something we spoke about at Brother Neil's funeral service. John chapter 6. Verse 37. John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. That's unconditional, you know. You know how we now have to avoid this? By putting in conditions. We have to say, yes, man, pastor, but it must mean that God will not cast us out. But we can do things to cast out ourselves. 
That is how these wicked people are, you know. God has said what he wants to say, but we want to void it by putting in our conditions. John chapter 10. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Unconditional promise. But people say, yes man, but... um. No one can snatch me out of his hand, but I can come out if I want. Then the same hand will hold you that nobody can take you out. It no hold you that you can come out to. Why we want to say what God does not say? Why we want to put conditions where God has no conditions? Is because we don't understand the nature of the covenants that God made with Abraham and the new covenant. We don't understand it. They are unconditional. If we, if brethren, you see, if we would just be honest and look at the covenants, it would be so clear because the Mosaic covenant is full of ifs. Just one more thing. Deuteronomy 28. I said this last week, I think. Deuteronomy 28. If you have a Bible like mine, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. If you have a Bible like mine, Chapter two, you see it? You can see it? <laughs> Chapter 28. Chapter 28 says, Blessings for obedience at the top of the chapter. And that goes from verse 1 to 14. At verse 15, it says, Curses for disobedience. 1 to 14. List the blessings for obedience, you know. 15 to 68. List the curses for disobedience. 14 and 14. 28 and 14. 42. 42 and 14. 56. 56 and 14. 70. Nearly five times. As many curses as blessings under the law. And that is what you want to be under. Brethren, let's be honest. The, co the new covenant the Abrahamic covenant Find one curse in any of them and show me. Find one if in those two covenants. When God taught about the new covenant in Jeremiah and Isaiah, all you read is, I will do this, I will do that, I will do that, I will nothing about if you will. You know why? Because he's going to make us will. He says, I'm going to write my law in your heart. And you will serve me. You know, no matter if you're going to serve me. Let's stand and lift our hands and give thanks to God. Unconditional covenant. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. It really just needs a little bit of honesty, you know. Just a little bit of honesty. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. 
Thank you for your word. Liberating word. It is this that Paul spoke of when he said, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty. Lord God, how else could wretches like us be saved? If you made any conditional promises to us, if we had to keep our end of the bargain, we would have been defeated before the covenant was ratified. We would have sinned even in thought before the ink was dry. But when you made covenant with Abraham, you signified to him that you would do it all by yourself, by walking through the pieces alone. And when it was time for the new covenant to be enacted, you similarly dramatized it when Jesus Christ was slain on the cross alone. He walked through alone. He shouted out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said it. He was abandoned because he was going through alone. And when, when the thief on the cross recognized what was happening, he saw the similarity between the covenants. He realized that you were walking through the pieces alone. But just that you were walking through the pieces of your own flesh, not the flesh of another animal. He said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And he was saved. As everybody is saved by faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for saving us in this way. And we ask you, Lord, to let this truth explain in our innermost beings so that we can serve you with godly fear not with the fear of men but with godly fear with godly reverence which is not devoid of love for even your fear produces love in our hearts or rather your love produces fear we commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.